thank you, uh, Lucille, uh, for the introduction. Uh, I think the last time Eric and I gave this talk was four years ago. Isn't that true? I think it was you and I together. Yeah, four years ago. And you always asked me to go first because I end up giving the introduction to like, Lioma. So, you know, I don't mind doing that this time also. But uh, next time it will be your turn. Um, anyways, uh, you know, they make us uh, disclose everything in our lives. And I initially I said that there's nothing relevant to the talk, but, you know, I got back and said, oh, you have stocks. Anyways, uh, it's not relevant to the talk. And they wanted me to put my social security number, and I said, no, there's a line. So I said, no, um, no to that. Anyways, uh, the topic uh, today is uh, brain tumors. And uh, in, order, you know, in order to go into some of the uh, more advanced uh, treatments that we're developing here, I'd like to give a little bit of background on the current treatment. So looking at the overall cancers in the body, brain tumors are not very common. These are primary uh, tumors, uh, about 2% compared to uh, the other cancers. However, there are a significant amount of uh, number of patients that end up having metastatic brain tumors. And our focus uh, in coming up with new treatments is not only to target glioblastoma, but some of the technologies that are, we're developing also address uh, metastatic tumors. And I'll come to that uh, at the end. One of the more uh, common questions uh, when I see uh, patients in clinic is, uh, how come I, I have a glioma or, or brain tumor? And the answer is always, we don't know. There are some risk factors. Uh, a common question is cell phones. Uh, there's really uh, no convincing data that cell phones lead uh, to uh, brain tumors. Um, although there are some data that uh, if you use a lot of it uh, over uh, four or five hours a day constantly, that could be a high risk. I tell my children, uh, try to text and not use the cell phone. Um, trauma, uh, again, there's some laboratory data that trauma uh, or uh, some of the other uh, uh, toxins can cause uh, tumors, uh, but in most patients, there's no correlation. We tend to see uh, meningiomas and some gliomas in, in um, uh, leukemic uh, patients, kids, um, who get radiated as an, at an early age, uh, after 10, 20 years, we've had a few glioblastoma, so uh, ionizing radiation could be a risk. Uh, there are some genetic uh, predispositions, uh, but again, most of these are uh, for benign tumors, such as neurofibromatosis uh, type 1 and 2 that cause schwannomas, uh, meningiomas. Uh, P53 mutation can lead to uh, uh, malignant gliomas and some of the other ones that you could see here. But again, there's no really clear cause uh, for uh, glioblastoma. Uh, when uh, somebody's diagnosed with a glioma, uh, one has to consider that there's a mixed uh, uh, population or mixed uh, picture of uh, tumors. So the gliomas are well demarcated and circumscribed, such as polycytic astrocytomas. These could potentially be cured, and these are uh, not very common. The glioblastoma or great uh, for astrocytoma are the most malignant, and these are the ones that we're trying to uh, find treatments for, better treatments for. Um, as far as grading uh, gliomas, it's not very complicated, although our pathologist makes it uh, sound complicated, but it's not. So um, when you look at these characteristics, um, uh, nuclear atypia, mitosis, so if the histology has uh, two of these characters or, or findings, you add a number to that. So, if, uh, you know, if it's nuclear atypia, then the, the uh, tumor could be a grade two, mitosis uh, makes it a three, and then when you get to necrosis, then it becomes a high-grade glioma. So uh, astrocytomas rarely metastasize, so we don't stage them. We only grade them. Uh, there are two different pathways of getting glioblastoma. Uh, most common is uh, in elderly patients where they de develop de novo glioblastoma. They come in with uh, symptoms uh, such as seizures or headaches. Uh, there's another pathway from low-grade gliomas where uh, patients are younger, uh, the tumors usually tend to have IDH1 mutations, and uh, they, they can progress over a few years to high-grade glioma. This is an example of one of my patients uh, had a low-grade glioma of the insula, which was resected. Uh, it was an oligodendro oligodendroglioma, which has a good uh, uh, feature. But then after a few years, uh, he presented with a rapid progression with hemorrhage, and uh, basically a, a hemi hemiparesis, and this tumor converted 
within a few years to a grade four astrocytoma. Uh, so for low-grade gliomas, we uh, uh, like to remove as much as possible. And if they're a favorable histology, we like to watch them. Otherwise, uh, we proceed with radiation chemotherapy. When the tumors do get large, uh, they can cause uh, headaches, uh, neurological deficits, seizures. And most of these patients go to emergency room, and, and that's where, where the diagnosis is made. Um, sometimes the tumor could be very small and still cause symptoms. This is one of my patients from Wisconsin, developed a hemiparesis on the right side. And if you look at the MRI very closely, you could see this little small enhancing area which we biopsied, and that turned out to be a grade four astrocytoma based on mitosis. He uh, decided to go to Mexico uh, from Wisconsin to pursue um, some holistic uh, medication, came back a few months. So you can see how rapidly they grow. Pardon me? Sunshine. <laughs> yeah, so it really didn't work, unfortunately. But by the time he made, came to us, he was already wheelchair bound, could not walk, and could not speak uh, from this hemorrhage, I mean, from this tumor. And that's within a few months. Uh, so these tumors can grow very rapidly. You know, if this tumor was in the liver, probably wouldn't have caused problems. But in this location, can cause uh, significant morbidity. Sometimes the tumors can grow without causing any symptoms. This is a, a grandmother with memory loss, and you can see there's already what we call a butterfly glioma across the corpus callosum and involving the frontal lobe. This is uh, an attorney uh, who noted that she could not uh, focus uh, on her work. And this uh, actually was a young patient who um, started having headaches. Um, and the MR was initially read to be negative. So MR is a gold standard for imaging. CT is not good. But when you look at the uh, T2-weighted image, which um, shows the uh, edema, you can see that there's a frontal tumor that was missed. Uh, so again, MR with T1, T2 images with contrast is gold standard. And that's, I think, one of the questions on the CME. So treatment options, uh, surgery, uh, radiation therapy, or chemotherapy uh, are standard uh, treatments. Um, the surgery uh, could be very helpful, and I'll come to that. But the issue with gliomas is that they're very diffuse. If, if I resect this tumor, um, I'll definitely leave some tumor at the edges. If one looks at histology, you can see invasive uh, tumor cells at the margin. So histologically, we can get to 90, 95% resection, but we can never get 100% tumor resection. Uh, one of the papers that came out by Dandy, who was one of the uh, fathers of neurosurgery in JAMA in 1929, uh, uh, he uh, proposed to do hemispherectomies. So if the tumor was in the frontal lobe, he would remove half of the hemisphere. And in the paper, he said that he had cured the glioblastoma except that a year later he came with an addendum to the paper saying that all the tumors came back still after hemispherectomy. Um, so surgery, uh, again, is very helpful, uh, but it's not curative. Um, our techniques have advanced significantly. This is an example of a, a deep um, tumor in the uh, speech centers. Um, so what we could do is we can do the, put the imaging into navigation system and we could transfer that uh, information uh, into the uh, operating microscope. So basically, we're looking at if, if, if it's, I can skip this if you guys don't. There shouldn't be much blood, uh, hopefully. <laughs> so you're basically looking at the, through the microscope, through what I'm looking for. So I can put the images, and through the eyepieces, the images don't show very well, but the tumor is deep. You can see the contour of the tumor deep to the brain. This is vein of Bay, which is uh, basically the temporal lobe. So if this gets damaged, the patient would uh, lose uh, speech and would get a venous uh, stroke. So the best way is after mapping is to find the best, uh, closest way to get to the tumor without damaging uh, the speech centers. And uh, you can see uh, it's like almost uh, flying a, a, a jet uh, where you can have these navigation. It shows you the distance to the tumor and then you could end up, uh, you could see the edge of the tumor here. And uh, this tumor was removed uh, uh, through a very small opening. So this uh, little hole is as big as uh, probably my index finger or smaller. Um, so again, our techniques have advanced uh, significantly. I'm gonna skip the rest of this. Uh 
So, so Tan, you know, these tumors that uh, in the past could not be removed uh, can be removed without significant morbidity. Um, and uh, one can help uh, with uh, the symptoms, you know, removing mass effect, controlling the seizures. And overall, if one can remove more than 90%, uh, the survival could increase significantly. Um, the only other problem is that no matter what we do, we can cause damage to the brain. So again, this is an example of a patient with a deep tumor in the speech center. Uh, we can map the brain with functional imaging prior to the surgery. So these are speech centers. We can map the brain interoperatively. So this is speech and motor. And one can map the wide matter tracks with the technology that we have. So one can de develop the trajectory into the tumor. Which, uh, but again, there will be some damage no matter how precise we are. The other uh, treatment challenge for glioblastoma or brain tumors is that uh, the presence of blood-brain barrier, which uh, prevents uh, passage of chemicals and, and, and uh, chemotherapies. Um, this blood-brain barrier is both a physical and chemical barrier, so very tight junctions in the endothelial cells. Uh, I borrowed this from uh, Jano, who's an expert in blood-brain barrier and microdialysis. Uh, so this prevents passage of some of the uh, novel chemotherapies, new chemotherapies into the brain. And finally, uh, the tumors are very small, smart. There are many pathways that lead to glioblastoma. So activation of some of these uh, receptor pathways uh, um, can be blocked, but uh, it's almost like driving in LA. So if you block one pathway, uh, if there's a traffic jam, then there's one can find another way to get to the destination. So I think, um, there's really no single uh, silver bullet to deal with the tumors. Uh, but, uh, you know, after what we do with the, all the modalities, we still can add uh, improved survival. We know that patients that are less than 45 years old do better. Uh, people that would get good uh, KPS do better. And also, recently, we found that MGMT methylation and IDH1 mutations are very important markers. So MGMT is a, a, a DNA repair enzyme, and people have methylation of the promoter do not express MGMT, and therefore the, uh, the response uh, to um, timozolomide is better, and the prognosis is better. Uh, the IDH1 mutation was also uh, recently found to have a, a direct uh, 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 correlation to prognosis. It's mostly seen in, in the low-grade gliomas, uh, and also in the ones that convert to high-grade. And the survival in studies have shown that the IDH1 mutation is much uh, uh, better. As far as standard treatments, timozolomide, uh, again, most of you are oncologists, so you're familiar with timozolomide. Uh, the paper that was published by uh, Stoop uh, showed that there was uh, definitely survival benefit. Uh, but if you look at the uh, median survival, the first paper that was published on chemotherapy was in the 80s. The median average survival, median for survival was 12 months, so now it's about 14, 15 months. So we made uh, a little bit of progress, but not significantly. Um, a drug that was really uh, exciting a few years ago was Avastin, um, and based on phase two trials showing that um, uh, there's improvement in survival, Avastin was approved uh, for glioblastoma. But again, uh, phase three trials a couple of years ago showed uh, that there was no survival benefit in randomized trials. We still use Avastin uh, as a sort of a last resort type of uh, treatment, uh, but uh, we, uh, we uh, try to put patients on other treatments uh, before going to Avastin. This is an example of a tumor that responded to CPT-11 and, and bevacizumab with significant progression. The only problem is that uh, this uh, uh, does not prevent the invasive portion of the tumor, and most often we get uh, multifocal glioblastoma with uh, bevacizumab, which are really resistant to uh, therapy. Uh, this Novo TTF uh, is a device that will be approved, um, and basically it's an alternating uh, uh, electromagnetic field uh, by electrodes that are placed on the surface. So patients, uh, the scalp needs to be shaved, and these uh, devices are placed and then uh, with a big battery pack, uh, the patients carry this, uh, and they have to wear it uh, a significant amount of time, you know, more than you know, 10, 12 hours. And it's supposed to uh, uh, cause uh, uh, damage to the dividing cells. So this is, what, this is uh, was approved based on um, 
some data on uh, recurring glioblastoma showing that it worked as well as uh, any chemotherapy. So I'm sure that made the oncologists feel bad that a device like that worked better than all the chemos that you could come up with. And then uh, this data that just uh, came out last year uh, was a randomized trial with newly diagnosed glioblastoma showing that uh, this Nova TTF device added uh, improved survival or median survival. So this uh, should be proved uh, uh, soon. Um, as far as uh, other trials that are coming, we were involved in a, a randomized uh, variant 3 EGF vaccine, so the results for that should come out uh, next year. Also, we were involved in a dendritic vaccine trial, so some of these vaccine trials will, will hopefully get approval in the next uh, year or two. Um, now, moving to our novel treatments at City of Hope. If there are no questions, uh, so that was the background. I'd like to move to what we're doing now. Uh, so there are two basic technologies that we're developing. One is the uh, use of uh, neuronal stem cells uh, to uh, basically target metast uh, metastatic and primary gliomas, and also the CAR T cell immunotherapy. So the concept of using stem cells to uh, deliver chemotherapy was uh, uh, basically uh, ex was uh, discovered by Karen Abudi, who's at City of Hope. This is about 12 years ago, and he has taken about 10 years to take this to clinical uh, trials. Basically, she noted that uh, if you in inject um, neuronal stem cells in a, in a glioma model, and the stem cells are colored in blue, you can see the cells migrate along the uh, glioblastoma, invasive glioblastoma cells. And this was shown in animal models, a, few, uh, on, on a, dump, a number of models. And then uh, working with uh, Jana Portnow uh, at City of Hope, uh, we were able to take this to a uh, clinic. So the idea was, was to take the stem cells, modify them with a gene, in this case, with cytosine deaminase. And this cytosine deaminase would convert 5FC, which is a prodrug, to 5FU. The 5FC does penetrate blood-brain barrier, but 5FU doesn't. And by releasing the 5FU locally, one can potentially target the uh, glioma cells. So uh, we finished uh, the first in human study uh, a year ago, and uh, Jana and Karen uh, show that the stem cells were safe. And using the microdialysis uh, technology, uh, she showed that the, the cells were not only uh, active, but they were making the 5FU uh, locally in the brain. Uh, they were not immunogenic after one injection. And we showed in, in two patients that we had autopsy specimen that they did migrate. So they duplicated what we saw in animal models, that the cells were working and they migrated along uh, glioblastoma invasive cells. So the trial that we have that's open right now is multiple stem cell injections. So uh, basically we remove the tumor, inject the stem cells, leave a catheter, and then patients get uh, stem cells f followed by 5FC. So this trial, uh, again, is being supported by uh, grants, is open, and I th we enrolled our third patient uh, a couple of days ago. So for some of you that may have uh, glioblastoma patients, they may qualify for this trial. Um, the next generation stem cell is also being developed uh, by Karen and Jana. And instead of the cytosine deaminase, uh, the uh, cells carry carboxyl esterase. So the, this is a secreted form of carboxyl esterase that converts uh, CPT11 to SN38. Uh, so the idea is that uh, gliomas are more sensitive to SN38 than uh, 5FU, and hopefully this will have uh, you know, better efficacy in glioblastoma patients. So hopefully this trial will also open uh, later this year for glioblastoma, recurrent glioblastoma patients. Any questions on the uh, stem cells or? Yes. So it's a neural stem, it's a cell line that was developed. No, it's already, it's a cell line that's developed uh, and, and uh, immortalized. So uh, it was uh, developed probably about 15 years ago by Dr. Kim from Korea, that was in Canada. So it's well characterized. Uh, the genotype is, is all sequenced. So it's a cell line, it's an immortalized cell line, yeah. So it's, it's a bank cell. Yes? Um, what was the first 5FC. 
but then it gets converted to 5 FU. So moving to the uh, CAR T cell therapy, um, so the idea is is uh, is to stimulate the immune system in the uh, brain. And uh, my own work uh, is on macrophages. And if if one looks at the uh, glioma, this is uh, another patient of mine with a small glioblastoma. When, when, we, when one looks at the inflammatory cells, you can see a lot of inflammatory cells, but these are not very active as far as inducing an anti-tumor response. So um, most often these macrophages or dendritic cells stimulate the lymphocytes. But the problem in the tumor environment is that this communication is lost uh, and, and uh, the T cells cannot target uh, gliomas because of the immunosuppressive milieu. So the idea here is to change the T cells uh, change the receptors so they can target specific proteins on, on that's expressed on gliomas. So uh, these are called chimeric antigen uh, receptors because they're not natural receptors. But basically, it's a T cell receptor bound to another protein. In this case, it's IL-13. So this idea uh, was initially developed by Mike Jensen, who used to be at City of Hope uh, until a few years ago before going to Seattle. Um, and uh, the antigen or the protein that, we, uh, that he picked initially was IL-13 receptor alpha because it expressed in most of the glioblastoma tumors. Um, we started our first uh, uh, feasibility study about 10 years ago, and the, the, it was an autologous uh, uh, CAR T cell. So we would get uh, patients would get leukophoresis at the time of initial diagnosis. We would make the CAR T cells and we would save them until tumor recurrence and we would uh, inject them into the brain, not, not intravenously, but into the brain. So we enrolled uh, three patients uh, many years ago and uh, we noted some uh, efficacy in, in a few of them. In fact, these are, again, these are recurrent glioblastoma with a survival of less than two or three months. And most of uh, the, all three patients lived um, uh, a significant amount of time, so more than what it was expected. I'll show you a couple of examples. Uh, this is a gentleman with a recurrent glioblastoma in the occipital lobe. Uh, we removed the tumor, left the catheter, and injected the CAR T cells, autologous T cells here. After a few months, uh, we noted there was some uh, inflammation. There was also some enhancement in the corpus callosum. So after another few months, this area where one would expect tumor recurrence disappeared. There's no tumor recurrence here, but there was enhancement here. So we biopsy that area, and uh, we noted that there was uh, both uh, T cells and also there was uh, there were mostly tumor cells. So again, uh, uh, we injected the T cells here and uh, caused uh, tumor death, so it killed the tumor. Unfortunately, this same patient came back a few months later with a frontal glioblastoma, but again, he lived about a year after the initial diagnosis. One of the problems with the um, initial card design was it, was it would take too much time to make, make them. It would take three months at that time. Also, uh, patients could not be on any, any steroids, and uh, they would develop a lot of inflammation at the site of injection. So we generated our next CAR T cell, um, working with a company named Sangemo, where we knocked off the glucocortical receptor and we used an allo, uh, allogeneic. So these are uh, donor T cells. They're CD8 cells. Um, this way we would save time and patients would come in. We had the cells already. We injected them right away. So this trial was started in 2010 and finished a couple of years ago. Again, just to uh, go over the number of people that are involved in these trials. So it's just not me and a couple of other people. Was, uh, you know, a lot of it by... Dr. Foreman's group, Christine Brown, who run the T cell immunotherapy lab, a lot of regulatory people, clinicians. The uh, design was uh, a little bit complicated and intense. So patients came in after imaging, we injected the cells into the uh, tumors uh, through a catheter, and then IL 12 and cells, IL 12 cells. So this went for two weeks uh, with close follow up. So this is one of our patients from Alaska. Uh, a patient with glioblastoma with multifocal disease, so already by butterfly glioma, uh, tumor in the, in the temporal lobe, in the speech area, 
uh, with good IL-13 receptor expression. So this uh, lady underwent uh, injection uh, through a catheter. Initially, we used uh, a, a micro pump, but then we shifted our injection to a manual uh, injection technique. Um, and you can see this is a PET scan. Prior to the treatment, you can see the metabolism, the tumor. And this is after uh, just two or three weeks. You can see there's necrosis in the tumor. And there was uh, seen also by MR, MR spectroscopy. Another patient, again, uh, initial tumor here recurred with a butterfly glioblastoma. Uh, this way, we shifted to a manual injection into a catheter. And very similar to the other patient, this is before treatment. You can see the catheter right there with the PET scan. And we saw necrosis uh, right at the side of injection. Uh, so out of the six patients we injected, we saw efficacy in uh, four but it was transient. The tumors still came back uh, within the margin. So uh, the issue with the previous design was that the cells were CD8, so they would kill the tumor and they would die themselves, so they would not persist. Also, the tumors that came back uh, did not express the IL-13 anymore, so they expressed other antigens, not IL-13. Delivery was also a problem. We were only limited to uh, 0.5 to 1 ml of injection, so we had to deal with that. And also, the cells did not migrate in the brain as much. So Christine Brown uh, has worked on the next generation CAR T cell. And this is a trial that's open right now. So instead of using the differentiated uh, CD8s, uh, we're now using the memory cells because they can give rise to CD4s and CD8s. And they, they last longer in the brain. Uh, also, the manufacturing has, uh, has, uh, has been changed so we can make these CAR T cells within three weeks. So by the time the patient comes to see me and get enrolled, we can actually do the leukophoresis, and within three weeks, we'll have the CAR T cells. And also, these uh, CARs have a uh, uh, basically a co-stimulatory uh, attachment, 41 BB, so they're, they're more, much more potent. Uh, this is some animal testing. This is the new CAR T cell design. This is our previous version, and you can see the new version is, is much more potent. In fact, if you drop the cell number by, by uh, tenfold, this still work pretty well. So uh, this trial uh, just opened a few months ago. We've treated two patients so far, and knock on wood, uh, results look very promising so far. Uh, this is some data showing that in mice, the, the new version uh, T cells last after a week of injection. The old version did not last uh, as, much, as long. Um, this is the design. So they get uh, three injections, and then they get imaging. And if we have more T cells, we can inject another three injections. So again, if you have patients with glioblastoma, they could qualify for this trial as well. The other problem that I mentioned is the tumor heterogeneity. Uh, so we're targe targeting IL-13 receptor alpha. But if you look at tumors, they express other antigens, like EGFR, HER2. And uh, the next generation CAR T cells would also target some of these other antigens. So we already, Dr. Uh, Brown's and Foreman's lab already are working on HER2 CAR T cells, which we can use for uh, glioblastoma and also metastatic breast cancer. So the uh, CARs have been made, and we're making the lentiviruses. Uh, so hopefully, uh, by the end of this year, we'll have an additional CAR uh, treatment for glioblastoma and perhaps uh, breast cancer. So that was the clinical part of the talk. And I'd like to go into uh, a few slides on um, what's going on in the laboratory also. So one of the problems I mentioned is the delivery. So let's say this patient with metastatic tumor, when we inject the CAR T cells, how would the T cells get to these multiple foci? And eventually, we like to apply this for uh, brainstem gliomas, which are seen in pediatrics. Now, one can inject into here, but um, uh, again, it's a very complicated area and could cause morbidity. Um, so working with um, some of our chemists, Jacob Berlin is a nanochemist at City of Hope. Also working with Shapiro, uh, we were fortunate to get an R21 to look at um, using nanoparticles in helping migration of the cells. So we generated nanoparticles, iron oxide nanoparticles. And we would inject them to the brain, and we use a magnet to move the cells in the brain. And uh, 
this is great, except that it's hard to control movement with one magnet. So we have another project with Caltech with uh, Ali Hajimiri, who's an engineer there with his team, working on a dynamic uh, programmable magnet. So these magnets uh, can be altered. So the, the electricity can move from in the circuits and one can move the electromagnetic field from different locations. Uh, so this uh, is still in, in vitro. Um, let's see if I can. Can you start that video? No, let's see. So you can see these are iron oxide particles uh, with magnetic field. So you can see the grid in the background, and you can see the uh, particles move to one side, and then you can move to the other side, and then you can control them and move them to the other side. And same thing with cells. You could do, uh, in this case, these are macrophages that are loaded with uh, iron oxide. So this is a uh, work by uh, Ethan and Alex, Alex from Caltech, Ethan from uh, Jacob's lab. So uh, I think we've shown this in vitro. The next uh, phase is to make a helmet for mice. Uh, so it's going to it's going to take some time, but uh, but hopefully we can do it. So um, basically, so we're developing CAR T cells against glioblastoma, multiple uh, targets. We like to apply that to breast cancer, lung cancer metastases. We're working on delivery, uh, uh, and also we're developing some instrumentation. Um, magnetic guidance is on, on the list. So next four years, when uh, Eric and I give the same talk, and you see some patients walking with this uh, helmet, you know the reason. <laughs> so that, I think, ends my talk. So uh, and I did it in 40 minutes. Not bad, huh? Yeah. Thank you. Any questions? Start off by saying that I have nothing to disclose, but if you got an offer, talk to me afterwards. So, uh, a, a very old teacher of mine, uh, one of the people who got me interested in radiation oncology, used to say that the problem isn't that tumors are radiation resistant, but rather that they come to us wrapped in packages that are very radiation sensitive. Um, this is particularly true of the brain, uh, and for that reason, and for, for that reason, uh, radiation neurooncology has always been uh, really the cutting edge uh, of the field. Uh, one of the reasons that it's always been uh, so attractive throughout my career, um, and it's given me a, a great opportunity to tell you not just about uh, neuroradiation oncology, uh, but really um, modern radiation oncology, a lot of which is diffused out from the neuro uh, business as a starting point uh, and is now being adopted for treatments all throughout the body. So I want to um, review some of the terminology and hopefully demystify it. Uh, People, oncologists, often hear about uh, radiation oncology stuff with our very arcane jargon. Um, so I'm going to kind of break the code for you so you can understand what some of this stuff means. It's really not that hard. So we're going to talk about uh, radiobiological foundations uh, of radiation uh, neuro-oncology. Um, I'm going to describe to you uh, the principles of so-called conformal radiation therapy or conformal dose delivery. Um, this doesn't mean radiation that gets along with all the other radiation. It means putting the dose where the tumor is and keeping it away from where the tumor isn't. And that's particularly important in the brain. Uh, you've heard probably of IMRT, intensity modulated radiation therapy. Uh, I'm gonna tell you what that is. Uh, explain how we use image guidance, daily image guidance, uh, for um, treatment delivery uh, in neuro-oncology. Uh, there are a number of very uh, capable, powerful treatment systems available now. 
Um, patients ask me which one's better, and I say, well, if you want a Lamborghini or a Maserati, um, I'm going to tell you about helical tomotherapy, which is the system that I've used the most because I've had access to it the longest. There's some other systems, uh, Rapid Arc, Brain Lab, um, and these all do very much the same uh, stuff. They're just provided by different vendors. Uh, review some of our current results uh, and then touch on uh, possibilities uh, for the future. So uh, some key terms in radiation. Uh, the current unit of radiation dose is the gray, uh, which is sometimes bastardized as 100 centigray uh, because a centigray or 100 centigray is the same thing or centigray is the same thing as a rad, which was the unit of radiation dose during my training. And then they switched it just in time for my oral board, so you had to remember to, to change it. We speak of fractions, and this is what we this refers to one of the daily treatments uh, that's given in usually a multi-week course of treatment of n fractions. Uh, the fraction size, the fractional dose uh, in gray in neuro-oncology is typically between 1.5 and 2 gray. Uh, and I'll show you why that is. And the total dose in the course of therapy uh, is the fractional dose times the total number of fractions. Uh, a radiation therapy plan is a detailed specification of the size, shape, direction, dose, and dose intensity for each of multiple beams that are employed to deliver each fraction and the total dose um, and these days, a plan um, is really code uh, to drive uh, or to instruct the computer that runs uh, the treatment machine uh, and delivers the treatment. And we describe radiation plans using isodose plots. Uh, isodose lines are more properly in 3D isodose surfaces. And these are sort of like uh, the weather maps that you're used to that show places of equal temperature or equal barometric pressure. So this is an isodose plot of a patient who had a resected occipital um, metastasis. Um, the dark red is, is actually the contour of the uh, resection cavity that you can see very nicely on an, on an MR, and I'll show you how we do that in a bit. The outer red line is the 15 gray isodose line. The yellow line is the 14 gray. Light blue is the 12 gray and, and so on. So uh, like in all of therapeutics, uh, in radiation oncology, we have a therapeutic ratio. And this relates to two different parameters, the TCP, the tumor control probability, and the NTCP, the normal tissue complication probability, and these are each sigmoidal uh, increasing functions of dose. Um, and if you had your druthers, you'd like these two curves to be really far apart so you could have a high probability of tumor control with a low probability of incurring complications. Uh, and in the brain, you don't usually get that. And these curves are closer together. Um, uh, that's the way nature gives them to us. Uh, and um, without the development of some of the technologies that we now have, um, high probabilities of tumor control would often carry um, a, a pretty significant risk of, of causing the patient's complications. In the current uh, era, I think it's fair to say that improving the clinical results of radiation therapy uh, really amounts to uh, one way or another improving the therapeutic ratio. And there's approaches that we can take to this that are both biological and physical. Uh, and to improve the therapeutic ratio, we want to move the tumor control probability curve to the left or the normal tissue complication probability curve to the right. Our biological approaches to this are to use radiosensitizing agents, uh, and malignant glioma is one of the uh, premier diseases for uh, chemo radiosensitization. So the, um, uh, the lipophilic alkylator uh, temozolomide 
uh, improves um, radio responsiveness of malignant glioma. Uh, it gets into the brain. It makes strand breaks in DNA, which is also what radiation does, and more strand breaks is more killing. Um, less used, uh, at least in neuro-oncology currently, although there is interest, are radio-protecting agents, uh, chemicals that would somehow make radiation less damaging to the good guys. Um, and there are some pro approaches to that being investigated that are predicated on the way that normal brain tends to be much better oxygenated uh, than uh, the malignant tumors. There are uh, physical or radiation physics-based uh, approaches uh, to improving the therapeutic ratio. And the premier of these is target delineation. And so if you don't know where the target is and you miss it some of the time, then you're, you're throwing away radiation and you're going to move uh, the control probability curve to the right. Um, not so much in brain, but in some other parts of the body, uh, target delineation is actually a four-dimensional problem. So if you're treating something in the lung or the upper abdomen um, and you're not holding your breath, uh, stuff moves around a lot. And we have modern technologies um, that let us track and gate uh, delivery of radiation to match movement, uh, breathing movement. Um, on the physics side, uh, moving the NTCP curve uh, involves also target delineation. So if you know where the target is, you know where the target isn't. And you can take measures to keep dose away from where the tumor isn't. And we often call this conformal avoidance. Uh, also what's critical is so-called dose homogeneity. So we have all these radiation beams going in, intersecting and adding up, um, and we like the dose to be what we prescribe. Not any lower, because you might not cure the tumor, and not any higher, because you might cause a complication. In practice, that winds up being very hard to do, but the better job you do of it, the better the dose homogeneity, and I'll show you in a second, a lower risk of complications. Uh, a, a concept that all oncologists are familiar with is logs of kill for a cytotoxic treatment, uh, true for chemotherapy, true for radiation therapy, so a given dose of radiation reduces a population of tumor cells by the same factor. Uh, so a dose of about six gray for most tumors reduces clonogenic survival by a factor of 10. And that means that you either take a billion cells down to 100 million, or you take 100 cells down to 10 cells. Uh, and ideally, you get down to one and then less than one surviving, and then you've cured the tumor. We define for normal tissue both so-called acute responding and late responding tissues, and tumors all tend to be acute responding like. The normal tissues that are acute responding are things like bone marrow, skin, uh, the mucosa in the aerodigestive tract, the mucosa in the GI tract. And acute responding tissues tend to have a, uh, a biphasic response. And I should have pointed out here. So if a given radiation dose reduces your population by a factor, that means that it's a straight line when you plot the logarithm of the surviving fraction against dose, so a log linear plot. You do a log linear plot for an acute responding uh, tissue. Uh, at a high enough dose, you get to that straight line, first order kinetics. Uh, but in the low dose region, um, there's, there's a lessening of the slope. And this reflects the ability of mammalian cells to reverse some of the damage that radiation causes. At low radiation doses, it reverses all or almost all of it, uh, but that capacity for repair uh, of what are 
DNA double strand breaks uh, is saturable. And then you get into this uh, uh, great uh, domain. So this is acute responding, normal cells, uh, and uh, tumor cells. And when we give radiation as multiple courses of treatment, you actually wind up getting the equivalent of straight line killing. Uh, we, we do the shoulder and the fall off for each individual fraction. In contrast to acute responding uh, cell types are late responding uh, tissues. And these are the ones that govern late complications. Uh, and they're prim primarily connected to stromal cells. And then the brain, that tends to be glia and endothelial cells. And instead of having uh, this uh, sh small shoulder turning into uh, a straight segment, late responding tissue, the curve never gets straight. It's very curved. It's very responsive uh, to dose, and in fact, it's responsive primarily to the square of the dose. Um, and this has important implications for how much radiation you want to give for each fraction. So if we look at the, at the upper part here, kind of blow that up, the late responding curve will be above the acute responding uh, response and then fall below it. And your greatest therapeutic ratio is at the dose per fraction where those lines are furthest apart. And um, a number of kinds of studies you can do suggest that in the brain, pretty close to two gray, maybe a little bit less. Uh, and part of why that met, so part of what that means is you talk to patients and say, God, six weeks of radiation for my brain tumor, can't you do it any quicker? Well, you can do it right or you can do it fast. So if you use a larger fraction size, you're going to accumulate less anti-tumor firepower. So you, you got to stretch it out. We just haven't figured out a way how to get around that. So this is the basis for the importance of the dose homogeneity that I was talking about. Um, so with older approaches, uh, treating a brain tumor, sometimes we would really break a hump trying to get 15% homogeneity. And that means that someplace where you're giving your golden two gray fraction size, another place uh, might be 15% hotter and it's 2.3 gray. What's 15%? Well, the therapeutic ratio at 2.3 is a whole lot inferior to what it is at 2.0. So not only does this spot in the brain get more total dose, each unit of that dose is biologically more consequential in, in the negative direction. And so hot spots is where critical uh, complication of cerebral radionecrosis comes from. And we really try to avoid that at all costs. So what is conformal radiation therapy? I said that it's putting the dose where the tumor is and keeping it away from where the tumor isn't. And there's a number of things that you need to accomplish this. You have to have superb localization of your target. And as, as Ben mentioned, uh, malignant gliomas are infiltrative, uh, highly infiltrative. And our target initially when we treat a malignant glioma is what looks abnormal on the uh, MRI expanded by about an inch um, because we know that cells readily migrate at least that far uh, into the surrounding brain. We have to use multiple X-ray beams, and I'll show you more is better, uh, and it's important that they be not opposed. And each beam has to be sculpted to the shape and size of the target as it appears from that direction of the, uh, the direction of that beam. 
So if you look at an egg from the side, it's egg-shaped. If you look at it from the end, it's a circle. And that means that a conformal beam is going to have a different shape and size for those two directions. And a lot of tumors are more egg-shaped than they are uh, spherical. Um, pretty much uh, all the time these days, we use so-called intensity modulation. And all this stuff absolutely positively demands uh, support of uh, intensive uh, computational power. Uh, when I was a resident, there were some things where uh, you, you could design a radiation treatment uh, with a calculator and a, and a table of, of numbers to look up. Can't do that uh, with, with modern approaches. This is a piece inside of the radiation uh, treatment machine called a multi-leaf collimator. And each of these slabs uh, is a piece of the tungsten alloy um, that is, and the, the radiation is exiting through the screen. So the source is back there and, it's, and we're radiating somebody over that way. So um, each of these leaves is driven by a servo motor and they can be uh, moved uh, and positioned with an accuracy of better than a millimeter. Um, and this is how the primary beam that exits the machine, that's either a square or a rectangle, gets turned into uh, things with curved edges, which is what tumors usually have. So here's a, um, a very centrally located um, metastasis, uh, pine a pineal metastasis maybe. And I'll point out how uh, this beam uh, is going to be smaller uh, and rounder than this beam uh, if the target is a is a spheroid, uh, an ellipsoid. And also, I point out that a, a beam like this is less conformal and is going to is going to do collateral damage on more normal brain on the way in and the way out above and below than is the case uh, for this beam. And so if you want to be conformal, you would pick this one and not that one. Um, and if you want to do that, that means that you need to know very well where your target is. So back when I was in the early part of my career, we would do these um, basically looking at an old on-film uh, CAT scan or MRI, and we'd have a ruler and some calipers, and we would manually transpose uh, estimates of size and shape um, from a diagnostic study uh, onto what's called a simulator film. Uh, pretty crude. Uh, all this is done electronically now. Uh, planning imaging that we get, MRIs and CTs, are transformed or transferred uh, electronically as DICOM images uh, into the planning computer and we get to work with them that way with, with sub-millimetric um, precision. Similarly, if your target is moving, then you're going to have some uncertainty where it is. Uh, so if the head is, if, if the patient's just kind of lying there and they're moving their head around and singing a song to themselves or something, uh, you're going to have to make your field bigger, make sure you miss, and if they are properly immobilized. So immobilization is a very key part of radiation neuro-oncology. Uh, for applications where we're treating something large like that inch all the way around for a malignant glioma, uh, we can comfortably immobilize uh, patients um, using a thermoplastic mesh mask that holds you still to about two or three millimeters. Um, plenty good enough for uh, a five centimeter um, malignant glioma target, um, but not nearly good enough for a five millimeter brain metastasis, where the, the uncertainty, the positional uncertainty with a mask is actually bigger than what you're shooting at. So when we treat small targets like METs, we use rigid immobilization uh, the system that we, there's a number of systems available to do that, 
Uh, the one we favor here is called Talon. And uh, the neurosurgeon that we work with very closely on these cases actually puts in two screws through the, uh, the bony outer table of the skull. Uh, they do this uh, with light sedation. And then for the uh, planning scans and the treatment, the patient is actually bolted to the table uh, by uh, these screws that are placed into the skull are sort of like uh, the screws for hanging um, a picture on a plaster wall. So it's a screw with a smaller threaded hole down the middle of it into which a smaller screw goes. So the patient lies down, we line them up, put in the smaller screws, tighten those up, and the patient is held still to um, better than a millimeter. So um, by, by reason of some details of the physics, uh, if you take two high energy X-ray treatment beams and point them at one another, you get a dose distribution that's block shaped. Um, and that's very good for treating something that's block shaped like a mediastinum. It's even really good for treating something block shaped like a whole brain. Uh, but if you're treating something like small metastasis or um, malignant primary tumor, um, you're putting in full or nearly full dose to a lot of brain that doesn't need it. So opposed beams uh, are non-conformal and we avoid them uh, assiduously. Uh, you can do a little better um, by putting in, say, a, a perpendicular beam like this. And back in the old days, this is the beam arrangement we used to treat pituitary adenomas. It's a little better, but that's still not very conformal. So if you want to get conformal, you got to use non-opposed beams. So here we have a three-field non-opposed arrangement. And the 100% isodose line is pretty conformal on the target, but the 70% kind of sloppy. So uh, what we can do is toss in three more not opposed beams, uh, and now both the 100% and the 70% are, are very nicely behaved. But 30% parts of the brain that are within two beams, uh, again, not so good. So what do you do? You guessed it, nine beams, all not opposed. Uh, and now even the 30% isodose distribution uh, is, is quite um, tightly uh, wrapped around the target. Um, multiple beams is especially helpful for targets that are elongated, uh, like this one. So here, uh, both 100% and 70% are, are not uh, real attractive. More beams, better. So increasing the number of beam directions improves conformality. And that's why the, the treatment machines that we use uh, for uh, sophisticated radiation delivery use the equivalent of at least 50 different beam directions, if not more. Um, for some radiation treatments, uh, like treating a breast, uh, the patient will be lying there and there'll be a beam that goes like this. And then one of the radiation therapy technologists goes into the room and rotates the machine around so it points to the other way. Okay? If you did that with multiple, multiple beams, it would take you all day. So it's not done manually, it's done automatically. Um, and, the, and the quality uh, control and assurance that goes into making sure um, that that all happens correctly is, is um, regulated by the FDA and it's very rigorous. So here is um, a brain stereotactic radio surgery case done with the system that we employed up until about nine years ago, uh, where we could practically use seven different radiation directions. Um, and this was actually one of those situations where somebody would physically go into the room and move the beam to seven different positions. Um, time consuming treatment, it took most of an hour. Um, and it's pretty conformal. These things that are hanging out are the directions of the individual beams. Uh, compare that to the system that I'm going to tell you more about in a minute called helical tomotherapy, uh, which is more like 100 beam directions. And you can see not only are we very conformal 
on uh, putting high dose onto the target, we're also conformally avoidant of the, uh, of the brainstem. So uh, a very nice treatment. So if, if you take out a pen and, and fiddle on your napkin, um, you can convince yourself that if you use any number of radiation beams that completely cover the target from that particular direction, you can never create a dose distribution that's concave. It's always gonna be a convex polygon, uh, the smallest one that completely uh, encompasses um, your target. So I just showed you how, uh, if you're treating something close to the brainstem, you're gonna want a concave edge to conformally avoid the brainstem or the chiasm, something like that. So uh, if you wanna achieve that, you need to do something different and that different thing is intensity modulation. So I took that L-shaped thing uh, and entered it into the old planning system, uh, the one, the, the seven beam step and shoot and ran a plan uh, and showing how IMRT uh, lets you achieve uh, any concave uh, dose distribution that you want. Um, and here's how that works. So a beam coming from this direction, uh, you're, you're gonna want it to be very intense to get the vertical leg here because you're not gonna have the beam exit through anything you're trying to avoid. Uh, but down here, since these beams are all gonna exit through the area we're trying to protect, they're gonna have to be of lesser intensity. Uh, Contrawise, the beam coming from 90 degrees away, you're gonna have high intensity, again, treating the, har the horizontal leg of the L. Uh, these are gonna be low. And the beam coming from this direction is, is gonna be sort of like this. That's intensity modulation. Uh, so a little uh, thought experiment. So here's that L in a bunch of different beam directions, three non-opposed beams, 120 degrees apart. Uh, this one doesn't exit through the protected area, so we'll make it two, two intensity units. This one doesn't exit through, that's gonna be two. Everybody else that exits through the protected area is gonna be one unit. Um, and then correspondingly down here. So uh, if you add those uh, beams up as either one, two, or none, you actually wind up getting a reasonably L-shaped distribution. If you do that with three different beam directions that are all non-opposed, 60 degrees separate uh, from the first set of beams that I showed you, you get something pretty similar. So what happens if you do both of them at once, composite six beam plan, you're actually doing really well. So uh, the bottom line is that increasing the number of beam directions improves dose homogeneity when you do intensity modulation. And in the mathematical parlance, each volume element in the target is served by some number of beams um, that also, each one of those beams also serve a bunch of other volume elements that are, that are different from first beam. Uh, the intensity of all the beams has to add up to what you want for all the volume elements. That's called degrees of freedom. The more beam directions you got, the more you can monkey around with them and make the numbers come out the way you want at the end. So not only does multi-beam uh, delivery technology help you with conformality, it helps you with hugely uh, with dose homogeneity as well. So, um, for our target delineation, we get, at least for neuro, uh, a high resolution CAT scan with some kind of a mobilization, a high mobilization uh, MRI. We have uh, powerful computer applications that allow us to fuse or register the two data sets. 
Uh, we have uh, computer workstations uh, where we, it's sort of like Etch-a-Sketch, and you can identify what's a target that you want to hit, what's a non-target that you don't want to hit. Um, these get submitted to um, a powerful computer, uh, and then ISIDOS plans are derived uh, and evaluated uh, often um, in conjunction uh, with our neurosurgical partners. So this is uh, such a pair of images. So same patient, uh, CAT uh, MRI and CAT scan. Um, you can see that uh, the brainstem here is really the brainstem there, and there's a little bit of the ventricle there, and you can see it matches there, and here's the end of the tent, and that matches. Optic nerves match, chiasm matches. So um, uh, we can get with very thin cuts, you can get two data sets to line up uh, to better than half a millimeter uh, routinely. Okay, and then um, for the purpose of the treatment planning, um, this will be identified as something that we don't want to treat. Uh, the chiasm is one of the most radiosensitive structures. We'll identify that as what we don't want to treat and so forth. This is um, an old case that I did uh, with um, Jenna Portnow, uh, and it's a lady who had a late relapse uh, of her breast cancer in the supracellar region, uh, very intimate with the chiasm, and she presented with symptoms much like a pituitary tumor, so she had um, uh, peripheral hemianopsia. Uh, and since the tumor was so intimately involved with the chiasm, we knew that there was no way that we could dose them differentially, uh, so we just wanted to make sure that there were no hot spots in the chiasm. Chiasm can take 45, not any more than that. This is the dose on the chiasm when you see that we strictly keep it at uh, 45 um, and respected uh, the optic nerves and the brainstem as well. So helical tomotherapy is one of a number of uh, very powerful machines uh, for giving um, multi-beam intensity modulated uh, radiation therapy. Also with the CAT scan, obtained for each treatment with a patient in the treatment position uh, to confirm that they are um, positioned correctly. Um, it is sort of the, um, uh, the, the Zeno uh, child of a high-end uh, radiation therapy machine and a spiral CT scanner. Uh, so in the donut, uh, is the radiation source. Um, it gets um, intensity modulated by one of those multi-leaf collimators like I showed you before. This is a so-called binary MLC where it's either open or closed, um, but the amount of time that it's open or closed is very, very precisely regulated, millisecond time scale. Uh, and this generates a total of 20 beamlets that emerge uh, and hit the patient. Uh, and then this thing, meanwhile, is rotating around uh, in the donut, always pointing at the patient, and the patient is slowly advanced on the table, uh, and so that they are, they are treated uh, in about one centimeter uh, segments, um, sometimes uh, for more than a, a meter of their body length. So, the machine looks like on the left and on the right, <coughs> patient is getting um, advanced in, and you can see the um, the rotating uh, the uh, delivering the treatment. Is it noisy? It's a little noisy, but you can wear uh, earplugs if you want. And, it, and it's a pretty remarkable device uh, because it takes a lot of heavy metal to do the shielding. So to have something that weighs a couple of tons rotate around uh, an axis of a meter um, to within a millimeter um, to 
horrific engineering feat. So this is a fishbowl full of a uh, chemical that glows when it gets irradiated, um, showing all those multiple beams turning on and off. And, you know, kind of reminds me of the fountain at the Bellagio. And there is also a, a computed uh, capability in the machine that automatically lines up um, the planning imaging and the mega voltage CT that's obtained for each treatment, and it figures out uh, the X, Y, Z shifts um, and the role um, uh, actions that are necessary to bring the patient into the uh, desired position for the treatment. Um, as the physician, if I go to the machine and look uh, to confirm positioning is the way I want, uh, the treatment uh, x-ray that day is, is the yellow one, uh, the gray is the planning scan, uh, and if you um, scroll through all the slices, you can convince yourself that, um, that the patient is in the desired position uh, within a fraction of a centimeter. So um, this is a case, um, I don't think it's any of the ones that you put up, where a um, uh, guy had uh, a right frontal uh, GBM that crossed the corpus callosum and also went back toward the basal ganglia, very extensively resected, uh, the tumor in the, in the corpus callosum was left alone. Um, so uh, treating tumor that crosses the corpus callosum is tricky because, uh, like I said, we have to protect the optic chiasm and the optic nerve, uh, and this is the dose distribution that was achievable uh, with the tomotherapy. Um, follows tumor across the corpus callosum, misses the brain stem, misses the chiasm, misses the optic nerve, and on the, uh, the sagittal, you can see that we even followed it down um, uh, behind the clivus. Um, another lady, uh, so a lot of adult malignant gliomas involve the temporal lobe. They're all close to the chiasm, they're all close to the brain stem, uh, and this is another example. Um, this is a lady uh, with a diffuse uh, grade three astrocytoma, uh, very large, um, really uh, just only biopsy was possible to confirm the diagnosis. So here the chore was to treat a very large volume very homogeneously. And you can see that uh, we prescribed 36 gray and uh, like 1% got as much as 38 gray. And we, uh, so remarkable job on uh, homogeneity of dose delivery. Um, this is medulloblastoma case. We didn't actually treat this one. This was just done as an exercise, uh, but there's evidence that the toxicity of the whole brain treatment that you need uh, for uh, tumors that invade the CSF space can be minimized if you spare the deep white matter in the centrum semio valley. Uh, and this shows that, that you can actually uh, accomplish that. Um, this is how we treat the spine. Uh, some of you may know that traditional treatment for medulloblastoma of the spine, uh, the patient is face down, and they can get disfigured by the immobilization device. The beam exits through the stomach and makes them vomit. Um, so tomotherapy winds up being a very nice way to treat craniospinal radiation. Um, so I showed you earlier the Talon uh, system for rigid immobilization when we give radiosurgery um, and uh, holds the patient very, very still, uh, do the contouring the way that I described, um, and you get um, very uh, tight conformal dose delivery. And in contrast to what I told you about fractionation, 
You can put high dose into the brain uh, in large fractions if you confine it to the tumor and keep it away from the normal brain. And with stereotactic radiosurgery, that's what we do. Uh, and very high fractional doses, seven uh, to as much as 15 gray, uh, can be given in one shot safely, um, provided all that dose is confined to the tumor and kept away from the normal brain. Um, very uh, effective treatment and, and very convenient for patients. And here's an, uh, a helical tomotherapy radiosurgery case again. Uh, we can also treat the spine very nicely this way. So uh, this is an older case where um, uh, the patient had a vertebrectomy and tumor was in the vertebral body, which had been here. The vertebral body is now gone um, and avoiding the spinal cord. Um, quite easy to do. Harder to hold the patient very still uh, outside the brain, uh, but we can do it uh, adequately with, with modern approaches. So uh, the use of many radiation beams uh, is desirable um, for all radiation therapy, both from the physics and biological standpoints. Helical tomotherapy is one of uh, a number of approaches currently available. Uh, if your rat that you work with says, well, I've got a uh, variant rapid arc instead of homotherapy, that'll do the same thing. Um, modern radiation therapy for brain tumors uh, is impressively well tolerated. Back when we used to treat a glioma very much the way we treat a whole brain with a beam like this and a beam like that, that made Jack a dull boy. Um, and now, um, uh, preservation of, of cognitive functioning is, is impressively improved. Um, hopefully, there's going to be further uh, development of radiosensitizing drugs, um, and it's likely that those will be uh, used most safely and effectively with, with fancy radiation like this. Um, so, uh, two of the, the old greats in radiation therapy. Uh, she line from uh, UCSF. If 50 years ago we had been tasked with the problem of polio, uh, we with radiation oncologists, today we'd have larger, more powerful iron lungs. Um, Henry Kaplan, the first to cure Hodgkin's disease, took the alternate approach. If you want to cure Hodgkin's disease, you have to learn to think like the Reed Sternberg cell. Um, I subscribe. Uh, very strongly to both of these um, points of view. Um, probably during my natural lifetime, we're going to have intensity modulated, energy modulated proton radiotherapy, and that's probably going to be it. That's probably going to be all the technology that you could ever have. Um, and at that point, if you want to do better, you're going to have to have the biology. Um, which is um, uh, sadly lacking behind our um, hematologist and oncologist con uh, colleagues at this point. And so I hope that I haven't left you like this, but have instead left you uh, engaged and stimulated. And I would be delighted to take any questions. <laughs>